Hello everyone, with this video I'll start a new sequence of videos, sequence of videos where I'll talk about general equilibrium with production. So the main difference between what we have done in the previous chapter and in this chapter is that the production is included and so there's going to be a new agent in the model which is the firm. So the firm produces some uh, outputs which I'm going to call consumption goods by using some inputs usually we're going to use a single input just for simplicity all right uh, well because now we have a third agent or extra agent uh, the standard model with two goods um, two agents is uh, more complicated for pedagogical reasons I'm going to therefore follow a uh, uh, sort of four models. So the first model is going to be the simplest and then the fourth model and third and the fourth model will be the um, you know uh, no restricted models and so it's going to be they're going to be a slightly more complicated. So if you clear uh, clearly understand the first and the second model well then the third and the fourth will be easier to follow. Okay well so Let's talk about some basic characteristics of those models. Well, because we are talking about general equilibrium, that means we have to have two goods, two consumption goods. Well, in this chapter, I'm going to call them consumption good rather than just good, simply because now we have production. So the input is into the picture. And then the question is whether the input is a consumption good or not. Do the agents, do the consumers consume the input and get utility out of it? Uh, it matters, uh, as you will see. So for that reason, what I do is um, in the first model, I'm going to talk about a single consumer and then well because the two consumer case is uh, a more complicated so just one consumer and then there's going to be a firm and the firm uses input to produces these two consumption goods but the input is not a consumption good meaning the agent does not get any utility out of this input think of this the input as uh, a piece of land and then the consumption goods are the apples and the bananas uh, the, the consumer, uh, the firm can produce out of this land. So the consumer doesn't get any utility from the uh, land uh, itself, but the production good apples and bananas. All right. Well, in the second uh, model, we're going to again still talk about the single consumer case. And this time the input will be somewhat consumption good. In fact, the input is going to be labor. So labor itself is not going to be the consumption good, but uh, the remaining hours, so the labor is going to be amount of hours you put. And so the, the amount of hours you have is fixed, right? Um, and so the remaining hours is going to be leisure. And so the leisure is therefore is going to be a consumption good. So in that sense, the labor is, I mean, the input is indirectly a consumption good. All right. In the third model, uh, well, we will just complicate the second model by introducing the two consumers. All right. Uh, again, the labor is going to be input for both agents. And then in the fourth model, um, the only difference with the third and the fourth is that the, the, we don't have the labor, but instead the input is one of the consumption goods. All right. And, but more importantly, we have, uh, so in model one, two, and three, we're not going to have any endowment, initial endowment uh, regarding the consumption goods. Um, in some sense, except the labor, except the input. So for input, there's got to be some initial endowment, right? I mean, if you don't have any input, uh, you, you can't produce anything. So therefore, there's got to be some input for the uh, endowment for the input. But here we will have extra uh, endowments for the consumption goods. Uh, so the model three and four are very much related. It's just the consumption good itself, not the labor, I mean, not the leisure, but just one of the consumption goods. Okay, so here's our first model where we have single consumer and uh, input is not a consumption good. So here's the model specific assumptions. And then here we have the uh, numerical example specific assumptions. So first the model specific assumptions. We have single consumer, just one consumer with a utility function. Uh, she enjoys both good X and good Y. So we denote the consumption goods as good X and Y. All right. As I said, there are two consumption goods. 
Well, the input is not a consumption good, all right? So we don't have a notation for input, but it's fixed. Well, what we have is what we call production possibility frontier, all right? So PPF uh, refers to production possibility frontier. So it's a function between X and Y. Well, it's a, a decreasing function. So um, we already know the production function. The production function uses inputs and then uh, produces outputs, all right? So here, again, my example is like a piece of land is your input, so it's fixed. So the size of the land is fixed. You can't change that. Uh, what you can change, however, the amount of X and Y you can produce. Um, you cannot, you don't, you may not use the land at all and hence produce no good X and no good Y. Uh, you can produce only good X. You can produce only a good Y. All right. And so you can produce a combination of X and Y. So usually the assumption is that uh, sort of because of the decreasing returns to scale, uh, it's going to be a, a concave, uh, not a linear, but a strictly concave uh, a, a, a function. And so this region is what we call production uh, possibility frontier. All right. So as I said, if you like, you can use, say, half of the land you have and you can you may want to produce this amount of good X, this amount of good Y. But you, that's probably inefficient. Uh, you would like to maximize your utility. And so you will probably produce somewhere on the boundary uh, because your optimization problem, graphically speaking, is going to be, oh, here is the good X and good Y that you can generate by using the fixed amount of input that you have. And so your utility, uh, you know, the, your indifference curves are going to be uh, distributed like this in this space. And so obviously higher indifference curves means higher utility. And so your objective is in a general equilibrium. Remember, we are looking for a, an environment where the agents maximize their utility. So they choose the demands, their consumption optimally. So you try to maximize your utility function, which means the highest possible indifference curve where the uh, the allocation that you're consuming is actually feasible, meaning you can produce that. So it's going to be something like this. Um, so, all right. So, for example, any, any point like this or this or this, these are not going to be optimal because uh, there are more uh, utility giving allocations that you are you can produce with this technology, with the production possibility. So anything outside of this uh, region so outside of this region is not feasible you can't produce them all right and remember this is an economy where you in an additional uh, products are not getting into the market so everything is basically determined uh, so in the standard general equilibrium model the everything the agents can consume were the initial endowments now the everything the agents can consume is what they can produce all right, well, here it's just one agent, but what she can produce. All right, so therefore, graphically speaking, the optimal point is going to be somewhere where the production possibility frontier and the indifference curves are tangent to each other in some sense. All right, well, we'll come to that in, in our numerical example. But this is what I mean or what we mean by production possibility frontier. As you see, the input is not in this picture because, as I said, the input is fixed. It's just whether you would like to produce uh, how many X and how many Y depends on how much of this input you would like to use. All right. And so it's given by the production possibility frontier. There is no cost of production for simplicity. All right. So you can produce X and Y with, uh, with, with no cost. All right. So it's just a, a constraint, a technology constraint you have, no cost. And then there's no initial endowments on the consumption goods. So the initially, uh, I, I mean, we can assume that the agents have some initial endowments on good X and good Y. Right? That would just, you know, complicate the constraints. And so, um, as I said, for pedagogical reasons, I'm going to go with this uh, simplest model. All right. Well, this is just one consumer. Um, oh, and I forgot that. What about the production? Uh, there's a firm uh, produces 
uh, the, the, the consumption good X and Y, all right? So uh, by using the input, the firm is producing the uh, input, and then the firm is owned by, owned by the uh, consumer, all right? Well, why do we need these, uh, this, this last assumption? Well, here is the thing. So this is a single uh, you know, agent decision problem, right? In order to find the optimal amount of good X and good Y, all we have to do is to solve the following question. Maximize utility of the agent subject to Y equals, well, the utility depends on X and Y, subject to Y equals G of X, which is the, uh, which is the technology constraint. Well, again, you have to, you, you shouldn't be producing Y less than GX. You cannot produce Y more than that. So you have to be on the boundary. So your Y has to be equal to uh, G of X. And then you maximize the utility subject to uh, this constraint. So that's the decision. Um, you know, you maximize the utility by choosing X and Y, uh, non-negative. So this is the decision problem of the consumer. All right. But the thing is, remember, our objective is to uh, create a general equilibrium framework where we have multiple agents to multiple goods. Multiple goods is here, but we don't have multiple agents here. So uh, we are coming to that. Well, for that reason, I am not going to solve this problem. I'm going to solve the general equilibrium version of this problem. So what does that mean? That means because this is exactly what we need to do in order to understand how things behave the way they behave when we have uh, two or three agents. All right. So in, 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 it's a, a general equilibrium model rather than single agent decision problem. So for that reason, what I'm, how I'm going to solve these, uh, this model is I'm going to take the consumer as, and, and the firm as two separate individuals. All right. So the consumer makes his optimization problem. The, uh, the firm makes its optimization problem, and then they can make trades on good X and Y uh, with the market prices. So we're going to have the price of good X, price of good Y. All right. So the firm uh, produces X and Y and, and sell those to the buyer, the consumer, uh, at a price PX and PY. But the nice thing about it is that, well, this firm may actually make a positive profit, right? Well, who is going to own this uh, positive profit? Well, this firm, by assumption, is owned by the consumer, so the, the profit of the firm will go to the consumer's budget constraint, all right? So, uh, for that reason, this assumption is important. Um, and as you will see, when we have, for example, two agents, um, you know, it will change the outcome whether one agent owns the entire company or whether they share the, uh, the firm equally or with some other ratio. Okay, so here is a numerical example that I'm going to solve. Um, so in this numerical example, I have... Uh, the production possible at a frontier, the PPF, uh, given by this, y equals 13.5 minus 0.5x squared. I know it looks ugly, but it at the end gives a nice x and y values and nice price ratio. Um, and then this is the utility of the agent. Uh, so these are given by the questions. Again, the firm is owned by the consumer and then the price of good X and then the price of good Y, uh, what is it in, in equilibrium? So in general equilibrium, what is the price ratio in general equilibrium? All right, so that's the question in general equilibrium or Walrasian equilibrium, let's put it this way, if you like. Okay, so what is the price ratio? That's what we would like to find. So how do we solve... Um, these problems. In fact, how do we solve any general equilibrium with production uh, models? Well, there are three steps, okay? It's very, very critical that you follow those three steps. Step number one, the consumer 
maximizes utility subject to budget constraint. So BC refers to budget constraint. All right. So the consumer is going to maximize his or her utility subject to budget constraint. Oh, I'm going to make this uh, condition two. All right. Condition one, the firm maximizes profit subject to uh, production constraint or technology constraint. All right. Subject to technology constraint. All right. Well, here it's the PPF. And then the consumer maximizes. Well, the order of you make solve these maximization problem is usually is not important. But the reason why I want to first solve the firm's maximization problem is because I want to calculate the profit function. And then I know that this profit is going to be included into the consumer's budget constraint. Remember, the consumer owns the firm. And so the profit will enter her uh, budget constraint. And so for that reason, I want to solve this first. And then, and then the third is that the market clearance conditions, market clearance conditions uh, should um, met. So therefore, what I'm looking at is, or what I'm trying to find is the price ratio such that uh, firm maximizes profit subject to technology. All right. And then the consumer maximizes utility subject to budget constraints. So therefore we find the optimal supply and then the optimal demand given the market prices. And then, but those market prices should be such that there shouldn't be any excess demand and excess supply. So the markets, both markets, uh, market for good X and market for good Y should clear. So this is the PX and this is how we find the PX-PY ratio. All right.